Welcome back, everybody. Um, in a minute, I'm going to introduce what I believe is our all-star speaker set here today. If you were trying to build um, a, a team for imaging AI, you've got the leaders, the thought leaders here. What's most interesting about this group is um, they've been involved in imaging informatics probably for at least 20 years plus, which has led to their um, capabilities in this field of AI. So they're very well versed. They are bench researchers, and at the same time, they are implementers. So they understand how to do some research here, take a project, and then develop it into product lines. And they're actually instrumental in establishing the governance for machine learning in the world of imaging. So in a moment, I'm going to introduce Keith Dreyer. But before I do that, I just want to set context. I thought it was fascinating in the first session this morning that as exciting as the technology is, um, there was a lot of talk about the sociology of machine learning and how it's going to affect lives. And sometimes I like to just keep things real simple in my mind. So around my home, I have a bunch of Google Home devices. And my wife and I are empty nesters. But multiple times a week, you will hear us shouting across the house, did you say something to me? Now, maybe we're a little deaf, but it turns out usually the answer is, no, I'm talking to Google. So Google is now a family member. And, and to me, the message of this is that you have to understand how not just the technology, which a lot of people here are excited about, but how it's going to affect what we, how we live and what we do. And clearly, machine learning is going to have an effect on radiology moving forward and imaging. The question is how we position it, how we use it. Um, part of this morning's talks were don't overestimate what it can do today. Put it in the right context. And I, I would think that most of us in the world of imaging today think of it as a supplement to what we do. I don't know what it'll look like 15 years from now, but right now that mix of human and computer interaction is very important. And with that, um, I'd like to introduce Keith. Come on up, Keith. So Keith Dreyer is the Chief Data Science Officer and Vice President for Enterprise Medical Imaging for Partners Healthcare. He also holds the positions of Vice Chair of Radiology at Massachusetts General Hospital Chief Data Science and Information Officer for the Departments of Radiology at Mass General and Brigham and Women's Hospitals, and Associate Professor of Radiology at the Harvard Medical School. He is American Board of Radiology Certified in Diagnostic Radiology, with a bachelor's degree in mathematics, a master's degree in image processing, PhD degree in computer science and medical fellowships in imaging informatics, and magnetic resonance imaging from Harvard University at MGH. Dr. Dreyer is the Chief Science Officer for the American College of Radiology's Data Science Institute and has held numerous board, chair, advisory, and committee positions with the American College of Radiology, the Radiologic Society of North America, and the Society of Imaging Informatics and Medicine, and he's had numerous global healthcare uh, affiliations over the years. He has authored hundreds of scientific papers, presentations, chapters, articles, and books lecturing worldwide on clinical data science, cognitive computing, clinical decision support, clinical language understanding, digital imaging standards and implications. On a personal note, Keith is one of the two speakers this afternoon, this morning that I know quite well. I consider him a mentor and a friend. I've known him for 15 years. And in addition to all those accolades, he's just a nice guy. So Keith, um, let's hear you. Thank you very much, David. It was a really a pleasure to be here um, talking about things you talk to at home. We're looking at baby names. I think the perfect name would be Alexa Siri, maybe? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Those got to be good. Um, I'm going to try to walk you through. I know you had a little bit of prep work around AI, but just maybe slightly different perspective from an imaging standpoint. So talk about the technology. Um, then I'm also going to uh, talk a little bit about the same thing, but from a healthcare perspective. So what can AI do for us in, in imaging, medical imaging? Uh, talk about uh, at home where I'm at, at uh, Mass General and the Brigham uh, Center that we created there, and then also in the role that I play at the American College of Radiology, uh, what the ACR is doing uh, with this new effort called the Data Science Institute. And then talk about the future, which I see a big opportunity for democratizing AI, making it a little easier for people with lots of data to actually develop uh, some artificial intelligence and try and implement it. And to David's point, um, my responsibilities are to do some of the future stuff for AI and responsible for that, but still uh, keep the plumbing and the lights on with uh, infra infrastructure 
around our hospitals up in Boston at Partners uh, to make sure that uh, the PAC systems run and uh, operations run on a daily basis. So I think it is true that I can talk a little bit about the blending of those and maybe somewhat on the panel as well. I know Kurt first in that as well. Uh, so imaging uh, technology, uh, just some names and terms, at least how I look at them. Clearly AI is the heightened public awareness term, but really machine learning is actual scientific discipline. And within that, deep learning is just a deeper, stronger inference because you have deeper layers. And one example of that is an artificial neural network. So people get these terms confused. They're kind of subordinates like this. But uh, overall, arching out of all of this is this data science concept. And so this is all of it, plus these real world complexities of trying to make this stuff integrated work, uh, designed, all the data engineering around it, everything. <clears throat> so when you try and train an artificial neural network with images, you basically, in this case, you pick a subject, you say, let's try and see if we can detect mountains, and then you have experts come in and take a look at this. And this is to just illustrate to you how important it is to make sure you pick the right experts when you're determining ground truth or annotating objects for this neural network to learn. So the images on the left, pretty clear that those are mountains. The images in the middle, pretty clear they're not mountains, but what are these things on the right? What would you call a plateau or a sand dune? Is this or is this not uh, mountains? <clears throat> and it's fine, you can say either one, but it's going to learn what you said. So in this particular case, let's say these two are. Uh, we don't know what these are, but let's label them anyway and say yes, that the plateau is, but the sand dune is not. And so then I actually would contour. In this case, maybe I want to try and make it more accurate or actually tell me about the mountain texture. So I'm going to actually go in and annotate on the images, similar to the way you would do it in medical imaging as well. So now I take an untrained neural network. I train it with thousands of non-mountain and mountain images. And when I do that, I am going to test this against some things that it hasn't seen before, some images. And I'm going to say, how am I doing from an accuracy standpoint? So these nodes that kind of sit out there uh, inside of these are software nodes. They're supposed to simulate the concept of a, of a biological neuron. And so you can kind of move these dials back and forth. You can imagine if you move this dial in software one direction, that 50% accuracy is going to go up. If you move it in a different direction, it's going to go down. And so you just keep moving these weights arbitrarily with what's called back propagation to see if you're doing it correctly or moving in the right direction toward this gradient descent. And when you do, <clears throat> you can actually start to see an increase in accuracy. <clears throat> and so eventually it's going to plateau and asymptote up. At this example, we're at 93.2%. Uh, this thing has the ability to detect mountains. So. Um, I then created a mountain detector. I can take a look at images that it's never seen before and see how well that performs. And it's typically what it's going to do is give you back a range of probabilities from absolutely not mountain, which is a zero, to absolutely mountain, which is a one, and all those numbers in between. You set a threshold and say above 0.8 is mountains or below 0.2 is definitely not mountains. The in between, I don't know. You can set those however you want, modify sensitivity, specificity, et cetera. But in, as we said, this plateau is going to say yes, and this one's going to say no, because that's how we trained it. So you can actually do this on your phones if you don't know this. Uh, inside of uh, your phones today, Androids and Apples, et cetera, uh, you can type in picture names like Find Me Mountains, and inside of your pictures it will show you all the mountains. This is the one I did inside of my phone. Um, and this is kind of classic because obviously Apple doesn't call this artificial intelligence, it just calls it your photo app. And so as AI starts to work better and better in many, many things, it just gets to be a smarter, better performing device or tool or piece of software. It's really not known as just AI alone. So what did we do and how did we build this, this development cycle? Well, first we had an idea. We were going to look for mountains. And then we did data engineering, all of that, pulling out the images, finding the right images, extracting them, giving them to the expert, have them draw them, determine what they are or aren't, all of that kind of stuff. And then we did the kind of the easy lift, which is training the model, which as everyone thinks is, uh, the hard part, but it's, it's, not the hard, it's not the most work that's necessary to make this work. Uh, and then the application itself. So just not to understate those other three parts, there's an awful lot of work that's necessary to make sure that you get those right and so you have a final application that works. That's the same thing for healthcare, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so basically what we're trying to do is blend uh, human intelligence with this kind of computer intelligence together. We've been uh, lumbering along pretty slowly, uh, and computation over the last 70 years or so has moved along pretty quickly uh, to be able to have some kind of comparable ability to impute. Uh, and so with that, um, the blending of these can be a little bit challenging because they're coming at, at different angles. And the key is, though, that you want to be able to have this kind of combined intelligence where you're taking the complementary advantages of both and bring them together. 
Uh, there are limitations, clearly, with AI. There's limitations with humans also. Uh, that's okay. You just need to plan for it. In this particular case, I, I love these. Apologize if you've seen this before. Uh, if you look for chihuahuas, which I did on my phone, I had a chihuahua so I can see all of those pictures. The challenge, though, uh, this was written up that if you uh, use AI to find chihuahuas, sometimes they look amazingly like blueberry muffins. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of funny, but that's just, if you know the shortcomings of these algorithms, you can kind of live with it. And the other, my favorite is uh, golden doodles look a lot like fried chicken. So, you know, to pick on humans, it's the same kind of thing. So if you stare at that cross in the center, just keep staring at it, don't move your eyes, and you'll start to see green dots, or you should, where that's kind of rotating around. And if you just keep looking, you'll see more and more green dots. All of a sudden, those purple dots will go away. Well, there are no green dots out there. So that's just to show that we have our own limitations. And so if you're going to try and blend these two together, you wouldn't want blueberry muffins and green dots. You want to be able to have the best of both worlds. You want to be able to use what the computer can detect and use what the human can, can detect and kind of complement those. And that's this notion of aug augmented intelligence. So the important thing here is that um, the way that you used to make computers smart was to do fingers on the keyboard programming. The future vision is to have a robot that just sits and watch like a newborn baby and learn stuff. But that's the future. That's not today. So what is today? It's this narrow AI. So you take a specific problem. I'm going to find a mountain and I'm going to train it up just like I showed you. And then if you try and have it find a zebra, it has no idea what you're talking about because the narrow AI was just trained for that use case. And so there are use cases that we have to define. And it's critical that we define those use cases correctly or else we're going to spend all this time ex uh, securing the data, curating that data, annotating it, creating the model, putting it in an application, and we really didn't fix the problem that we thought we had. So it's really important to understand that. So now let's switch gears and talk a little bit about those use cases. Uh, so here we are, back where we were with these use cases, and if you think about now a different cycle, this is the diagnostic information cycle for medical imaging, probably the same for pathology, other areas. So clinical care on the left side here, someone needs to order an exam, it gets protocoled, the exam gets performed, imaging is spits out, some data, an interpretation takes place, you inform that clinical care group, and so on and so on and so on. So there's opportunities here to define these use cases throughout. The one in particular that's uh, kind of the darling these days is actually to help the radiologist at the time of interpretation. And so you want to be able to define use cases there. So there are many, many different use cases, but if you think what it is that a radiologist has to do, all the use cases that they have to have in their brain, they're pretty extensive. And so you can slice this up if you want to by organ systems, which I've done here uh, horizontally, and then also by modalities, CT, MR, ultrasound, PET, et cetera. Uh, and then within that is all the anatomy. An anatomy repre represents itself differently on different modalities, so you need to learn exactly what they look like. And then there's the findings. And so inside of that, you want to be able to say there's a disease here or this is a normal variant, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an awful lot of what we would call detection use cases uh, that you would have to be able to create to simulate uh, what, what a radiologist has learned at the end of the time that they take their boards. So again, you can slice into say, let's just look at all CT, or you can say, let's just look at all thoracic imaging, or you could say, let's look at the intersection of CT and thoracic imaging. And within that, you could say, I want to look uh, at the pulmonary system, just the lungs. There's a lot of other things that goes through the thorax. Uh, and then I want inside of that, look at pulmonary nodules. So that is one specific use case of which there's thousands. And if you look today, over AI has been created for healthcare over the last few years, there are 32 models today currently available, commercially available, that have been F through FDA approval uh, for our space in medical imaging. And that's what they look like on this grid. And so of those 32, two of them are full CAD di diagnosis. The other are non-diagnostic. They're just assistance through uh, mainly guiding you as to which case to read first, to triage, detection, quantification, those kind of things. But you can see we have a long way to go. And that's just for interpretation. There's also for imaging, protocoling, clinical care, a lot of different things that can take place and AI can assist in these kind of defined use cases that can improve what it is that we do every day. I'll talk a little bit now about uh, the Center for Clinical Data Science, which was set up in late 2015. Uh, at Mass General and the Brigham uh, to promote and create and commercialize AI for healthcare and really to kind of put AI in the hands of our thousands of researchers. 
So we have this environment, as all of us do at, at provider care facilities, where we can identify these clinical use cases, uh, do some data and analytics, and then uh, product delivery inside of our, our own organization, uh, and be able to kind of run that as a cycle. So that's what we do inside the center. Uh, to understand the end, end user needs, to have large amounts of compute uh, capabilities, and then product de development, regulatory control, uh, clinical workflow use, all of those kind of things. It's basically a pipeline that goes from R&D, uh, fosters this innovation into a real world uh, implementation internally or commercialization externally. Uh, we started obviously with uh, zero employees and now we're up to about 60 and ramping up to about 84 by the end of the year. Uh, this speaks mainly to the drive and the interest that's there in artificial intelligence in our organization. It's not like we're trying to rapidly put more people in this space, we're just being requested to assist some of the other researchers by giving their tools and infrastructure. So the goal is to really educate our researchers so that they can do AI themselves. Um, uh, we have a number of collaborations inside and out. Uh, one, the one I think was uh, the most helpful from a perspective of vision from our CEO was for us to really plan to roll out artificial intelligence to all of our clinicians and clinical researchers uh, over the next two years. That's uh, thousands of researchers, about a dozen hospitals or more, and a couple billion dollars in uh, funding uh, for research. We currently have about 30 PhDs and or MDs involved in AI development. Uh, we've annotated about a million and a half of the 20 billion images that we have, uh, about 85 models out, and over 100 publications, just to give you scope and size. The goal at first was to actually build models, but on the tail of that, we realized that they're not much use unless you can actually deploy them. So then we're in the process now of building up an entire methodology, which I can't uh, state enough how complex this part is to be able to make sure that you can put hundreds of things that didn't exist before in place in clinical practice and monitor them and update them and constantly keep them improving and make sure that they don't fail. So this is a big effort uh, that we've been undertaking for the last three months and it'll probably take us about a year to complete. Um, but you can imagine as we're continuously getting this feedback back, we're continuously improving the models. And so just like software, you want to version this stuff, but you also want to innovate. So when we do have partnerships and people want to be able to pull this out, we can snapshot it, take it through FDA and make it available, but internally we can still continuously improve. Just some examples, we've created a uh, MR lumbar spine looking for stenosis, for aminal stenosis. That's one of the uh, most frequent procedures that we do, so we've created a way with high accuracy to be able to automate that process, assist the human again. Uh, we have also have aortic aneurysm detection, smart MR PET and CT scanner uh, protocols with uh, device manufacturers, uh, neurology stroke suite and cervical spine fracture detection is just a few uh, of the several that we've implemented. Um, to talk about the neurology one, it really involved more than just putting it on the pox, it's putting it inside of a workflow system so that they can kind of follow the patient when they're seen at various facilities through the telestroke uh, infrastructure that we have. Let me talk about uh, the American College of Radiology's effort around data science. So in about the same time, about 2015, the ACR uh, realized that uh, mainly I think it was because of the IBM Watson commercials that were taking place at the time. and the we're going to replace radiologists kind of talk, um, woke up the ACR and said this is something we really need to probably look at. And in doing so, um, to their credit, they said, you know, this is really something that will be positive for this field. Uh, it can be if it's done right and if it's done wrong, it might be another AI winner or it might just not do anything of any value. And so the board approved the creation of what's called the Data Science Institute uh, and really kind of set a strategic plan uh, for that. Uh, the goals and objectives really uh, stated with a single sentence is to advance data science as a core to clinically relevant, safe, and effective radiologic care. And the goal is to really kind of lead, uh, define, and educate, and lead for the purpose of making sure that we're doing good and we're doing the right thing. Uh, hopefully this will abstract over to pathology and to ophthalmology and dermatology and the other areas that are heavy uh, visual, um, but also to define the benef beneficial uses of this specific to radiology and then to educate on the appropriate use uh, inside of our field. Uh, we have a large advisory board overseeing this. There's been a lot of activity that's taken place since its inception two years ago. A couple that I'll talk about are the ones in red on the left. Some of the early thoughts were kind of that cycle that I was talking about. So if you let everybody create use cases, the problem is that the inputs and the outputs could look completely different for say a pulmonary nodule detector. And so how can you take 20 algorithms that get created 
need to connect into an infrastructure that's already at thousands of hospitals and make sure that you can interchange those, bring them back and forth, make sure that they're accurate, consistent, that they don't change from patient to patient or from algorithm to algorithm. And so that the definition standard needs to be set up. Um, the concept of creating this I'll talk about later with AI Lab. Then the notion of certifying these. So th if they're FDA approved, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna work in your facility. Uh, so the certification process is necessary. It's, all of these things are tricky because it's kind of, there's nothing to really look at as to how you would do this, how someone else has done this before. Uh, so the certification process is underway and we're working with the FDA around that. And then finally to assess. One of the things that the FDA wants to do is have a shorter pre-market certification process and have a longer post-market analysis. So put algorithms out into the field quicker, but when they're out there, continuously monitor them to make sure that they're not going off the wheel, off the rails. And I'm not even talking about continuously learning algorithms. I'm talking about kind that go out and are static, but imagine the scanners, the data, the information, the protocols are changing. So that means that the algorithms could be breaking down uh, with time. So these are some of the efforts uh, that have been underway by the ACR. Most recently, though, I'll talk about, uh, for the rest of the presentation, uh, AI Lab, or this notion of democratizing AI. To me, one of the worst things that could happen in AI in general, but in healthcare, is just a couple of very large companies have so much money and so much access to technology that they could actually define what this looks like for all of us. I mean, that's fantastic and wonderful, but if that's the only ones that can do it, uh, is that really the right way that we want to have this happen? And I would argue that if we could put tools in the hands of thousands and thousands of researchers, clinicians, physicians, uh, interested parties in data science and other areas, that we'll probably get a broader spectrum of letting a thousand flowers bloom and see exactly uh, what comes out of that, which ones are the best. And so this notion is, the other piece of this is trying to teach people AI like this lecture and telling you about it only goes so far. You really have to get your kind of hands dirty and figure it out. And so to date, it's kind of challenging unless you have a bit of a computer background. And the thought was, can we give tools to people to let them play around with this space without having to have any kind of programming experience whatsoever? I think the answer is yes. I mean, remember trying to do graphics 25 years ago before PowerPoint, and it was a programming effort. Now I just kind of draw boxes and circles. And so it's almost the same kind of thing, I think, in the future. Using AI should not be that complicated to have to create some of these things. So I'm gonna talk and show you a piece of a lecture that I gave last week uh, in DC around this notion of democratizing AI. So the fact that we have this incredible amount of data, which has all the value is great, and people use the analogy that it's like oil, but uh, that kind of falls short unless we really know what to do with it and what our end goal is. With oil, you're gonna make gas, let's say. Well, what are we gonna make with this? And if we're gonna make AI, what does that mean? So uh, if you look at the just dollars invested in this space, healthcare is clearly number one, and within that, imaging is also pretty high up, and the data amounts is just staggering. So a lot of this is not as much of an AI problem as it is a big data problem. And so how do you deal with that, and what do you do? Well, so to the analogy of extracting value and comparing data to oil, at least we know how to refine oil, and we know what the hydrocarbon products are that we want to come out. And so now you can create a refinery anywhere and start to extract these things out of the crude oil. So to that point, if that data product endpoint, let's say, is just that one part of the circle where you do the interpretation. So if I want to make those algorithms that help me to do interpretation, then the oil for me are those images. And this data source is coming from our scanners and our devices, and our PAC systems are these huge data repositories. So what people often do uh, today is to just say, well, I don't know what to do, it's so much data, I've got to worry about patients, I don't have time for this. And so vendors kind of come along and say, well, we'll happily take that data for you and we'll happily turn it into something amazing and maybe we'll even pay you back a little bit for it. So now these people wind up with their data inside of someone else's repository and the fears that we have for this is the whole notion around, are they even going to get it right? I mean, I would argue that you, the folks that have created this data, that understand the patients, that understand and continuously see this information flowing, this data is not static, probably are in the best positions to actually answer the questions of what it is that I want to make, what can I make, and what do I want to be able to do to improve patient care, and how do I do that? The other challenge of pushing this stuff outside your facility is all the potential for data loss, data theft, et cetera. So if you were to do this inside, if you were to create that refinery, uh, inside your facility, what would that look like? That's what I want to talk about here. So if you use the crude data and you release that, now you've got kind of this licensing thing of just a big blob of data. And people are doing this and they're making some money, 
Um, but I don't know that they're reaping the rewards of actually watching that uh, data turn into value such as AI and getting it back to them as if they committed a little bit more effort internally. And what is that effort? Well, if you can kind of turn on this data refinery, some of the things are just anonymization, normalization to make sure all your scanners or devices look the same, the data coming out is the same, and then be able to start to annotate that, to put that kind of mountain range drawing, the ground truth definition, because you're in a great position to be able to do that. So that's this notion of AI preparation. And then beyond that, as you start to do more refining, you're talking about building AI models yourself, validating those models, and integrating those models into your workflow or patient care process. And then beyond that is this notion of actually federating them, so working with other colleagues at other institutions without moving the data, but using the models to build a stronger model, a higher accuracy model, leveraging both or more and more of the data that didn't have to leave your premises, going through regulatory process or regulatory approval, FDA clearance, and then continuously learning uh, when the FDA gets there. They've, they've had a uh, document that came out that talked about what they want to do, but you can imagine in short time that these algorithms will be able to continuously learn and continue to be able to be approved uh, if they're learning in the correct way. Uh, so all of this refinery stuff is what ACR AI Lab is looking to do. It's a big, big effort. It's kind of a moonshot. Uh, but I think even the effort of doing this is informing many vendors of what it is that's missing and what the opportunity is. The fear is if we don't do this is that it just looks too complicated, the final mile problem, all of that. Radiologists don't know what to do, clinicians don't know what to do, and so the goal is to kind of just spark interest from this angle so that industry can kind of move in this direction versus just moving data off premises. Uh, so ACR Lab is, uh, AI Lab is a free open source AI framework with standard component integration. Uh, it does those things that I talked about, anonymization, normalization, annotation, uh, and then you could license that data. Everything is on-premise, stays inside. If there are AI algorithms, like created by the, the masters at Google and Microsoft and elsewhere, uh, you can integrate those in like anybody can. You can usually use those to build and validate AI on your own data uh, and then deploy those if you choose to under appropriate FDA requirements of uh, investigational use, et cetera. You can federate uh, with other colleagues that are doing the same thing. Uh, you can go through the regulatory process if you wish, and you can also do the continuous learning process. So this is, as I say, a long step process. We started this back in January is when we built it. We first released the first version for education in May, and it continues on. Um, this is that AI lab. Uh, if you go to the website, AILab.acr.org, you can kind of step your way through how to learn, define, annotate, just kind of get a good feel for how these things work, how they don't work, uh, what the terms are, what, where they break. Um, and then also uh, there's this notion of challenges, so to create uh, community challenges where people can try to build algorithms themselves, uh, use data and compete, uh, and then also a pilot that I'll talk about. But this is really designed for clinicians, for radiologists, but as I said, we're in discussions with CAP, for pathologists, ophthalmologists, they're very interested in doing something, so we'll probably just give them the shell of this and let them expand it from there on their own. Uh, the ACR has done a number of things, like DICOM, uh, Triad, so AI Lab is one of these things, but I mentioned this and I show this slide because there's another important piece, and that's this ACR Connect. So I'll describe what that is quickly at a high level. We accredit devices, so we accredit CT and MR and mammography, uh, and all of those things. So in doing so, there's a couple of groups that do, but we're the largest, about 98% accredited through us. So by virtue of that, we're connected to over 18,000 imaging facilities across the United States. So that kind of final mile. So the goal is to take that ACR Connect and use that as a basis to connect AI Lab. So if you want to use AI Lab and just simply learn about this stuff and kind of be safe and not use patient data that hasn't been anonymized and approved for public viewing, you can do that on just AILab.com, or it's .org, I'm sorry. And this is, allows you to experiment with these models, uh, anonymized cloud-based solutions. So once you kind of get facile with that and you're in a department, how would you hook that up to your hospital? Well, this alone does not provide integration to local hospital systems. That uses Connect. And so as we mature Connect to not just do registries and do accreditation, and it steps into this notion of supporting AI lab connectivity, now you can start to do all those things that you wanted to do in a regulatory controlled compliant uh, method for that. So they're really two separate applications, and this is what we're experimenting now with putting together. And that's through this uh, consortium with seven academic medical centers. Those are University of Washington, UCSF, MGH, Emory, Leahy, Brigham, and Ohio State. 
And what it is is to place Connect out there, this new version that allows AI lab connectivity, so people will be able to now share models, validate models, test models, federate stuff back and forth, but they can do it in a kind of a way where it's like a telephone system. So in this case, UCSF and Leahy can communicate back and forth models and test and try, but everyone can kind of do this independent of each other. And so again, the goal is to not make this the end all be all solution, it's just an open reference architecture so industry can learn exactly what it is that I think and we feel is going to be uh, probably the way to do this uh, in the future. There are uh, other folks that are interested in connecting in, uh, and so we're expanding this out, but we're doing it carefully to make sure we don't get ahead of ourselves. So just in summary, I have one second left. In summary, uh, AI has a huge value for your organization and beyond. I, I hope that's clear. If not, I think it will be with time, particularly in our domain in medical imaging. I think selling your raw data alone has low rewards and has high risks, so I would just say beware of doing that. Uh, you, I think specifically at your organization, have the unique clinical knowledge that's necessary to refine your own data, unlike anybody else, because you understand uh, your patients, you understand your scanners, your devices, the outcomes, et cetera. And I think learning to use these data refining tools, which are, are extremely new, so buyer beware, such as AI Lab and the other tools that are coming out, hopefully from industry, it'll really enable you to create AI and other high-end uh, value data products. Thank you very much.